Welcome back everyone, it's Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know, and today we're gonna to talk about the lawsuit we all knew was coming. Helena Hutchins, her family, has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Alec Baldwin, among many other defendants. We're gonna look at that lawsuit today, but instead of talking about the facts and the causes of action, because we've talked a lot about that, and it's basically exactly what we expected and exactly what we've talked about on this channel already, we're gonna look at who she sued, how they set up the complaint, but we're also more importantly going to react to a press conference that her lawyer gave already in this case, because I think it tells us everything we need to know. It tells us what their strategy is. It tells us what they think, and it tells us what they have used and reviewed in getting to this point. We're also at the end of the video gonna look at the reenactment that her lawyers have produced of this shooting. And we're gonna talk about whether or not this is even admissible, whether or not this reenactment video is even gonna be able to be used in court. And if not, what's the purpose of having this reenactment video if it can't be used in court and it can't be used in trial? Okay, so if you're gonna follow along with this video with us, please subscribe to our channel. We've done a bunch of videos on this Rust shooting dealing with Alec Baldwin, the armor, all the lawsuits going around, all the criminal investigations, but this is the big one. At the outset, it seemed like Helena Hutchins' husband and Alec Baldwin were on the same page and it didn't seem like anybody was blaming each other. We said, when the rubber meets the road, we think a wrongful death lawsuit's coming down from Helena Hutchins and we absolutely believe Alec Baldwin will be named. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at the lawsuit and see who exactly Helena Hutchins and her family sued in this case. The very top of the lawsuit tells us this information, okay? So as we know how the case heading works is the plaintiff is up top, Matthew Hutchins individually and on behalf of his son, Andros Hutchins, a minor child, and Christina Martinez as wrongful death personal representative for Helena Hutchins. So what all does that mean? Well, Matthew Hutchins individually, that's her husband, and on behalf of his son, their son, Andros Hutchins because he is the guardian of and the parent of Andrew. So a minor can't file a lawsuit on his own. They have to have a guardian or parent file it on their behalf. So the husband is filing it individually for himself and on behalf of his son. So that's two plaintiffs. And then the third plaintiff is Christina Martinez, who's the wrongful death personal representative of Helena Hutchins. Now, why is the husband not the personal representative? Well, sometimes in cases like this, they have a professional one. We talked about how that can bite you in the Alex Murdoch case. But in this case, those are the three plaintiffs. So there's a wrongful death lawsuit and a loss of consortium claim in here as well, which is the loss of the personal relationships that she had with her husband and son. So they have individual claims and the estate has a claim for the wrongful death. And if you just look at this complaint and you go down, that's the plaintiff. Now let's look at the defendants. Very first named defendant, Alexander R. Baldwin III. So Alec Baldwin is not just a defendant, he is the lead defendant in this case. And I think they wanted to make it known that they believe he is culpable, and we'll hear from the lawyer in a minute. But also on this defendant's list, Rust Movie Productions, LLC, El Dorado Pictures, Ryan Donnell Smith, Langley Allen Cheney, Thomasville Pictures, Nathan Klinger, Ryan Westerstein, Short Porch Pictures, LLC, Anjan Ngayem, Brittany House Pictures, Matthew Del Piano, Calvary Media, Ryan Dennett Smith, Gabrielle Pickle, Third Shift Media LLC, Sarah Zachary, Seth Kenny, we've heard those names before, PDQ Armin Prop, we've heard that name before, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, we've heard that name before, The Armor, David Halls, we've heard that name before, The AP, Catherine Walters, Chris Sharp, Jennifer Lamb, Emily Salverson, Streamline Global, and does one 100? Is that another one? I think that is another one. So all of those defendants, they've sued everybody. Everybody that was there, all everybody that had control of the gun, all the production companies, anybody that had control over the set and the safety and everything that was going on. And in this complaint, they have listed every single defendant what they believe they should have done that they didn't. And it's everything you can expect. No live ammunition, safety protocols, training, handling of the gun, pointing the gun, pulling the trigger, whether you should do this or shouldn't do that, whether this should happen on a movie scene or shouldn't. All of the things we've already talked about. And if you guys want me to take a deeper dive into this complaint specifically, let me know in the comments by writing complaint. 
And if you want me to dig into this complaint, we can. We've just done a lot of that. And to me, the most interesting part about what's come out over the last day or two is this lawyer press conference that he just made a lot of statements in here that I think are really telling to where this is going. So let's jump to that now. Never should have happened. Never. Was there any evidence uh, that you found of, of uh, sabotage as has been suggested? No, we found no evidence of that. And we know that, that they haven't really said anything. We haven't seen any evidence of that. So the very first question, is there any evidence of sabotage? Because that's kind of what I think maybe Baldwin and some other people in the media are kind of planting seeds for that. Maybe somebody did this on purpose. Maybe they did this to get at Alec Baldwin. What is their sabotage? The lawyer says, we found no evidence of that and nobody said anything about that. Nobody's brought any real evidence of sabotage out. And I'll tell you, as, as horrible as this sounds, we're just talking from a personal injury perspective, a wrongful death lawsuit. This is what I do. And in these kinds of cases, if there are intentional acts that cause the death, that absolves most other people of liability. So if I come in and I want to shoot and kill someone, then the negligence of other people kind of falls by the wayside. So if somebody came in and even though all these safety protocols were in place and no live ammunition was supposed to be there, if somebody breaks the rules purposely, puts the ammunition in, gives the gun, sets Alec Baldwin up, that could absolve Alec Baldwin of most of the liability and a lot of the other parties in this case. So an intentional act of sabotage is not good for this negligence type wrongful death that they have filed a lawsuit on behalf of the family and against all of the defendants in this case. So he's pretty hard against sabotage at this point. It doesn't totally ruin their case, but it makes it worse. I'll just say that. Do you have any evidence of whether or any information about where the line bullet came from? Do you know that? Well, that's still being investigated. We do know there was a other live ammunition on the scene. So this wasn't a, a fluke where somebody put one bullet in a gun to sabotage this. Once again, he, he said a couple important things there. He said it wasn't just one bullet in sabotage. He's just going to try to cross that out. But he also said a very important thing that all lawyers should say in press conferences like this. There's still a lot of investigation to be done. We're still gathering evidence. We're still building this case. Don't lock yourself in. Leave it open to what you could find with more investigation and more evidence. Other places. On the lawsuit says the gun discharged by releasing the hammer. When the expert spoke on the presentation, you made it seem like it discharged by Alex pulling the trigger. So which is it? Well, I think it's clear what happened. The, Alec had the gun in his hand. He shot it. Helena was killed. Now, do we have the video? We don't have it all yet, but the gun cannot fire unless the trigger is engaged and the hammer is back. All right. So we've got their position. The gun cannot fire unless the trigger is engaged and the hammer is pulled back. Now he's going to reference experts here. We know that's coming. They reference it in the complaint. There is going to be a lot of expert testimony about safety, about what happens on sets, about ammunition, about how this gun works and whether or not it's possible for it to go off like Alec Baldwin said it went off. Let's listen for something closely here. So he had the gun. He says he pulled the hammer back. It fired. She was killed. He says he pulled the hammer back. We knew for a fact that that live interview that Alec Baldwin gave was going to be used against him. He is taking his own words. This lawyer took words from Alec Baldwin's mouth and has built his theory of the case, built his theory of negligence, put it in the complaint, and is quoting it here in the press conference. His experts are going to use it to disprove what Alec Baldwin said and to prove what he said was not true and physically impossible because he gave Alec Baldwin for, I mean, no pun intended, gave them a ton of ammunition to use against him. And we're already hearing his statements referenced here. But as far as this lawyer is concerned, their theory of the case is it's impossible for this gun to go off without pulling the trigger. And Alec Baldwin pulled the trigger. Therefore, he's culpable. Well, look, I'm not an armor expert. The experts will look at it and, and make any determinations. But we don't think that the weapon was what caused this, any defect in the weapon. The weapon was made to fire. It fired. I think it was recklessly disregarded to the disregard of all the people there, the safety. It was recklessly disregarded for the safety of all the people that were there. That's literally quotes from the statute, from the negligence or reckless indifference for wrongful death. That comes from the statute. 
that reckless disregard. That's what they're going to have to prove. That's the verbiage he wants to be in everyone's head at this point. And, the, and that's why this happened. Had they not been reckless, somebody doesn't get shot in a movie set. I mean, when was the last time that happened? This doesn't happen unless people cut costs and engage in reckless behavior leading to a senseless, tragic death. This stuff doesn't happen unless people cut costs and have reckless behavior. Again, here's the theory. They were cutting costs. They picked profits over people. It would have cost a little bit more money to make it actually safe, and they shouldn't have done it unless it was going to be safe, unless they were going to undertake this fully and appropriately and put in the proper safety precautions and not act recklessly. It's clear where he's going here. Well, there's no no figure listed in the complaint. The amount of damages will be substantial, but that will be assessed by the citizens in the community there in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and they will weigh in and they will hear the evidence and they will decide what is fair and just compensation, but it is substantial. A long time marriage, soulmate is lost, and a boy to be raised without a mother at a young age is a tremendous loss. So they asked, well, how much are you guys asking for? And like most complaints, you just have to have a jurisdictional amount that it's above and you don't have to pick the exact number right now at the outset of the case. And the reason for that is the jury gets to pick. It's not like the lawyer picks and whatever number I ask for, I get. It's not like they say yes or no if I say a case is worth a million dollars. They get to pick the actual number amount. Now, we give them ideas of how to calculate that and what we think it's worth during the trial. But he's right. The citizens in Santa Fe, New Mexico will determine what this case is worth. And they are the only ones who can determine what this case is worth. And anyone that's even been close to experience it knows that that goes on forever and ever and ever. Well, there are many people culpable, but Mr. Baldwin was the person holding the weapon that, but for him shooting it, she would not have died. Oh, now we know why his name was listed first, maybe. There are many people that are culpable. Again, he doesn't want to tie this down. And we read through the complaint, all those defendants. Tons of defendants in this case. And he's saying lots of people are culpable. I don't want to let any of them off the hook because I'm probably going to get settlements from each one of them or I'm going to ask the jury for money from each one of them because they had their own part in this reckless behavior and this negligence behavior. But without Alec Baldwin pulling that trigger, but for him having the gun in his hand and pulling that trigger, this death doesn't happen. He is absolutely culpable. There were a lot of questions. Oh, is this going to happen? We knew this lawsuit was coming. And they're pointing the finger at him. He is the most culpable defendant, according to Helena Hutchins, her family and her lawyer. So clearly he has significant portion of liability, but there are others. And that's what this case is going to be about. Assessing fair apportionment to whoever's responsible for the senseless tragedy occurring. Fair apportionment. So chopping up who owes what, right? So that, that press conference basically gave us everything we need to know. We know what they're going for. We know what their theories are. We know what their experts are going to say, and they're going to do a lot more investigation. Okay. And we're going to find out a lot more as this civil case continues. Let me know what you want us to follow. And actually one of our subscribers on Facebook, Sue Wilson, sent me this article that has the press conference. It has the reenactment video we're about to watch and it has all the information we're bringing to you. So let me know like that. There's all sorts of different ways you can get a hold of us. Our emails posted at Tragos Law everywhere, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Find us on there, send us whatever articles you want us to take a look at. And if enough people are interested in something, we're gonna bring that content to you. So here's the, the last part of the video. There is a disclaimer and there's a disclaimer that they put on the screen. So we're gonna show that disclaimer, but this is the video that the lawyers actually have prepared and showed as part of this press conference. We're gonna watch the video, then we're gonna talk about how admissible it is.
So that's the reenactment, okay? And this is more of a demonstrative aid than anything else. And demonstrative aids, just like evidence, in order for them to be shown to the jury or used at trial, they have to be relevant first. So is this relevant? I think it's a pretty good argument that yes, it's relevant. It kind of explains and shows what happened. They're not gonna be able to talk much about this without a lot of other testimony setting the scene that this is factually correct and appropriate where everybody was sitting and what happened. But again, they have Alec Baldwin, the defendant in this case, his own statements setting this scene. So I think at the very least, he would corroborate where a lot of people were. So they can use that. I think they can create relevance to this video and it may not be able to be explained without an expert, whether it's a, a movie set expert or a gun expert or whatever. So they can use an expert to help explain this video to the jury and use this as a demonstrative aid while an expert is testifying. But the biggest hurdle that they're gonna get over is all of these, all these pieces of evidence, especially demonstrative aids, they have to be more probative than prejudicial. And this is extremely prejudicial. This is going to inflame the jury. It's just like showing pictures of a dead body where some cases that is allowed, but many cases it's not by showing a huge car accident. Or we have people that create reenactments of car accidents for us or accident reconstructionist where they play a little video of the accident. Sometimes we have to cartoonize it as to not make it too graphic for the judge to let us play it in front of the jury. So it's really a call for the judge as to whether or not this prejudicial video, meaning can they prove this is actually what happened, that he pulled the trigger? Are they going to say this is what the video would look like, whether he just pulled the hammer or the trigger? I think that would help. But is this going to be too prejudicial that what it actually proves is not necessary because they can prove this without the video? They can prove what happened in the church and what happened on the set with the testimony. They can prove it with pictures where everybody was standing. They can prove it with other parts that they have filmed and other scenes that they have filmed from the movie where the stool or the bench is and where the, the crew would stand and where the camera was and where Miss Hutchins was that they don't need this graphic reenactment. That's what the argument's gonna come to whether or not this is admissible. So if it's not gonna be admissible, why would they use it? I think that's pretty obvious. They give us the public and they give the media and everybody that was there a visual as to what happened. And it helps them explain exactly what happened and it tugs at the heartstrings and it does inflame the public. And it pulls on our passion and it makes us angry that this senseless death has occurred literally at the hand of Alec Baldwin. So that's kind of the purpose of it. I think if I had to guess right now, it would not be admissible at trial. They would not be able to show this video to the jury, but I could be wrong and maybe one day, we'll find out. So let me know if you enjoyed this video by hitting the like button. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already and leave any questions and comments you have in the comment section below. But for now, that's all we've got. Thanks for watching this episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you like this content, please share it with your friends. Make sure you subscribe to our page and like our videos. If you want some interaction, get in the comments and we'll be sure to get back to you. If you want to know any more information about our firm or this page, you can find out in the description or visit tragoslaw.com. We post multiple times throughout the week, so make sure you hit that bell so you can get the notification and not miss out on the next episode.